Good morning, and thank you for joining us for the Ministry of Health virtual media conference on the national COVID-19 response for December 6, 2021. Our panelists today are the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, Dr. Avery Hines, Technical Director, Epidemiology Division, Ministry of Health, and Dr. Adish Sergi Singh, Director in the Directorate of Women's Health. I am Al Alexander, Senior Corporate Communications Officer in the Ministry of Health and your moderator for this morning's media conference. We begin with Dr. Hines, who will present the latest clinical and epidemiological update. Dr. Hines. Thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning to the Honorable Minister. Good morning to my colleague, Dr. Suju Singh. Good morning to members of the media, members of the viewing and listening public. I'm not sure if we have the slides up and available, but I will go straight into the clinical update. As at December 5th, 2021. Data as at 4 p.m. on that day and time indicate that we have tested 457,734 individuals or have run that, that number of tests, of which we have had 75,134 total positives returned. Of those individuals, 60,582 have recovered. We've had 2,262 COVID fatalities, and we extend our condolences to the members of those bereaved families. And we have currently 12,290 total active positive cases, which are distributed as follows. There are 11,002 individuals in home self-isolation, 526 individuals in hospital, 161 in step-down facilities, and as at yesterday, there were 601 new positive cases identified in the last 24 hours, which would relate to samples that ran from December 2nd to December 4th. As relates to the vaccination status, we note that there are at present 648,920 individuals who would receive at least a first dose of a first dose regimen. Those who have completed a second dose of a two dose regimen, sorry, a two dose regimen, would be 603,828. There have been 44,563 individuals who have been vaccinated under a single dose regimen so that those who would have completed uh, their vaccination regimen either with a two dose or a one dose vaccine currently numbers 648,391 and with respect to the distribution of the additional primary doses there have been 32,627 additional primary doses delivered to date and as we keep uh, outlining the statistic of the proportion of individuals in the parallel healthcare system not fully vaccinated currently stands at about 89.8 percent, uh, with data going up to about November 17th or thereabouts. If we have the remaining slides, we want to move into what we look at as our brief uh, epidemiological update. And it's really just to point out that at the, this juncture, as we move from week 47 into week 48 and 48 into 49, next slide please, we are seeing that continued increase in the number of weekly case cases accumulated, and we're also seeing an increase in the positivity. Now, this increase in the positivity is partially due to the uh, sampling strategy, which is really focusing on the high probability and high risk uh, cases being sampled preferentially. So this doesn't represent 60 odd, odd percent of the individuals in the population but it does represent those who are currently being sampled uh, being positive. The positivity rate represents the percentage of those being sampled that come back as positives. And that has climbed as both the number of cases have climbed and this sampling strategy has been somewhat adjusted. Looking at the same data, now on a 
monthly basis. Next slide. We're seeing that we have rolled all the way into uh, the almost the end of the, well, the first week of December started the epidemiologic weeks work a little differently. So the first week of December actually started in the last three days of November. So the total that we see there is for December alone, but the epi weeks would have split that slightly differently. But we are seeing that we're catching up with the November total relatively quickly because we've only had uh, five days of December so far and we've already reached the total that you see on the screen. So we do want to admonish to to advise, to beg that the activities that we engage in that get us into contact with one another, that we do those to the least extent possible and in the safest way possible to reduce the rate of transmission that we're currently seeing. And of course, at the back to advise the continued uptake of vaccinations as we have vaccinations available for all those who are currently unvaccinated but vaccinatable. Next slide, please. The next thing I'll just show here is in a slightly bigger format, that week-to-week -week transition. So this is a slide that we will put up onto the, uh, onto the ministry's website. So we see the week-to-week -week percentage changes from, from one week to the next throughout the entire epidemic year. Next slide. Next thing I want to really focus on is the, in, the information about the Omicron variant. And it's really just to reiterate what the CMO would have presented uh, for those who may have missed it on Saturday. And we do note that the Omicron variant is a new, the newest of the variants of concern that would have been identified by the WHO. It was designated as a variant of concern on the 26th of November, and it has been uh, designated as such because it has certain features that are of public health concern. Those features include the fact that it has mutated somewhat from the pre-existing versions of the virus, and those mutations affect that spike protein, which makes it a little more difficult for the immune system to recognize, and therefore a little more likely to cause what they refer to as immune evasion. Now, that is one aspect of the concern because the immune evasion uh, impacts the ability to reinfect individuals who have been infected before, and also to some extent to infect individuals who've been vaccinated. The other concern is that those mutations that we've seen may also change and, hope, and possibly increase its ability to spread and that is to be transmitted from one person to another more easily. We're still looking at the data on this uh, globally, so the jury is out on whether that is really the case or not, but they have seen that in South Africa in particular, where a different variant was in circulation from what we have in Trinidad and Tobago, the beta variant seemed to be outcompeted to some extent by Omicron in the uh, initial studies that they were doing. That doesn't necessarily speak to what will happen with either gamma or Delta, which were the variants mainly in circulation here. So we continue to observe and to collect data, and we will update as additional information becomes available. Uh, now, the WHO has, has designated the global risk as very high uh, because it may lead to additional surges in COVID-19 infections in the countries where Omicron takes root. And really, the main factor is that one of the best protections against Omicron or any variant remains the vaccination. Current vaccines remain effective against both hospitalization, severe illness, and death. And at present, we do know that although the S protein and the gene that are affected have, mut have mutated, the tests that we currently perform in Trinidad and Tobago to detect COVID-19 aren't affected by that mutation, so we're still fully capable of doing that detection. So those are the, the public health uh, updates or key points in a nutshell for the Omicron variant and for epidemiologic update. I will turn you back over to Mr. Alexander. And thank you very much, Dr. Hines. And we welcome back Dr. Adish Surjasing, who will provide us with an update on women's health as it pertains to COVID-19 and the influenza vaccine uptake. Dr. Surjasing. 
thank you, Mr. Alexander. Good morning, Honorable Minister, Dr. Hines, members of the media and the viewing and listening public. So my job today is, as I come here every month, to provide an update of the performance of our maternal and newborn health services. So can I go straight to the slides, please? Thank you very much. Next slide. So these statistics will run up to until October. We are still collecting November's statistics. We'll have that ready by next week. There were 12,192 births since the start of this year, with the majority of which, over 90.3% for this year, being in the public health care system. I want to reassure you that all maternal and neonatal services are available and have been up and running within the healthcare facility since the start of the pandemic. In addition, internal systems for management of positive pregnant patients and newborns have been in, put in place at all our public health facilities. Next slide, please. This is just a quick reminder again, this, we are in the influenza season and we continue to remind our pregnant population that getting an influenza, the flu vaccine, is the first and most important step in protecting you against the flu. It protects both mom and baby and reduces your chance of being admitted. It is safe at all stages of pregnancy. It has been used for many years, millions of doses have been given, and the vaccine is available at all our antenatal clinics. Next slide. So this here, this slide gives an update of the number of COVID-19 cases in our pregnant population from the start of the pandemic. Sadly, we have reached a number, another unfortunate milestone of 1,000 plus cases And now in our, our database of pregnant women since the start of this pandemic. And at the lower end there, you, you can see some of the numbers. We had a high of 161 in September, 126 in October, and 150 in November. Some of these figures will be updated as new data comes to hand. Next slide. Just a reminder of the vaccines in pregnancy. We, since the start of, since end of June, actually, we had approved Sinopharm for use in our breastfeeding population. We also have approved Pfizer BioNTech for the second trimester and above as of the end of August. And then we added on Pfizer again for breastfeeding women. The reason I am reminding the population, I'm, I am reiterating that the vaccine is safe in, in the breastfeeding population, especially where I have had some reports of persons being told otherwise. The most up-to-date information is available on the Ministry of Health's website. In terms of the new vaccines um, started during pregnancy, I actually just got a, a quick update from Mr. Lawrence Jaising. We actually have 962 persons who would have started their vaccines during pregnancy. Uh, unfortunately, this works out to just around 300 per month. We would like to see these numbers improve. The last slide, please. Yeah, so just again, a reminder of this information. It still holds. This comes from the Center for D Disease Control. I am reminding everyone that pregnancy is a very high risk condition. If you contract COVID and become symptomatic. And these are numbers from the United States and are fairly similar. Only 31% of the pregnant population um, have been vaccinated or have taken the vaccine. Um, I'd just like to come back to me, please, and just to give another important update with respect to the outcomes of our patients. Um, since 2017, Trinidad and Tobago has been doing exceedingly well with respect to the reversal of the maternal deaths that we were seeing prior to this. And for four consecutive years, we achieved what is called the Sustainable Development Goals targets, which are less than 30 per 100,000 live births, which equates to on any given year, we had four or less maternal deaths for four consecutive years. Sadly, 
Just as I was saying from the start, the last time I was here, we had recorded two maternal deaths, as a, which was related to COVID-19. We've now doubled that number. There are two additional maternal deaths, details of which I will not be able to share quite yet. These are clinical issues, and we are still investigating. But this means that for this year, we have seven maternal deaths in total, instead of the, the higher level of four. So we will not be meeting our, our targets for this year. And this is one of the impacts that's being seen worldwide. Mothers are dying as a result of the COVID-19. So I want to ask the population one more time to form that barrier around our pregnant population. What we have been finding is that persons are bringing COVID, they are unvaccinated, or pregnant patients are also unvaccinated, they're bringing COVID into their home and infecting these higher risk populations. Um, I just want to add again that reminder that, as I said before, there are certain high risk conditions. If you are in the second half of pregnancy, if you are older for pregnancy, we consider above the age of 35. If you are obese, um, patients with chronic diseases. These are even higher risk pregnant women. I have also some sad news to also say, just in closing. We have now four confirmed cases in, in our database of mother to child transmission from mother to child of COVID. Um, and we, the outcomes have not been good. I can't go into details, but these are things that are happening right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and it's been seen across in the United Kingdom as well. And this is largely affecting the unvaccinated population. I thank you for being able to listen to me. And we thank you, Dr. Sergi Singh. I now invite the Honorable Terence Dial Singh, Minister of Health, to provide the updated vaccination figures and highlight the current issues pertaining to the vaccination campaign. Thank you very much, Al. Good morning to Dr. Hines. Good morning to Dr. Suryu Singh. Ladies and gentlemen of the media and the listening and viewing public, wherever you are, good morning, Monday morning. So vaccination numbers, they have not changed significantly since I was here on Saturday. 649,300 have received their full shots and 648,651 have received their second shots. Those who have accessed their additional primary doses, 32,922. Ladies and gentlemen of Trinidad and Tobago and the media, and I'm hoping the doctors can back me up on this. The preliminary information about Omicron seems to be that it is less severe. But unfortunately, that has been interpreted by people around the world that they don't have to worry about it. And I'm hoping that the two doctors, I, I, I just dropped this on them, this wasn't practiced. What is happening around the world when I speak to um, people around the world? Uh, because I do have a network of people in Vancouver, Australia, UK, United States, doctors and epidemiologists who I speak to. The current narrative is one that is being taken by the public across the world to mean that Omicron is somehow less severe. Those are some initial findings in small populations of people. We still don't know. So the key takeaway is that to treat Omicron and its arrival in Trinidad and Tobago as serious. Treat it as seriously as we treat Delta. 
It is early days yet. When Omicron was first um, discovered in seven countries, it then rose to 23. It's now in 40 countries, so it's spreading around the world. The takeaway message, um, what I've been asking the population to do for the past few weeks, even before Omicron, was that of vigilance. We need to be vigilant. The vaccinated, you have that extra layer of protection. However, you still need to practice the public health measures of wearing your mask, especially washing your hands, social distancing, and thank you for being vaccinated. Uh, for the unvaccinated, you have to follow those three W's even more stringently because you don't have that extra layer of protection that a vaccine will give you. And we urge you at this time of congregation, of meeting, of meeting and greeting people to be even more careful um, of yourself and those around you who depend on you for their safety. Um, for the past three weeks, We have been tracking closely, literally on an hourly basis, our hospital occupancy. On the 19th of November, which is about three weeks ago, our hospitals had 503 persons in it. Then we peaked at around 572, and as of the 6th of December, we are down to 509 which is about a 69% occupancy. Um, a decent sign. It means that the vaccines are in fact working, but unfortunately people are still dying in what I consider to be very large numbers, unacceptably high numbers. And we could have a serious impact on those numbers if people follow the three Ws, get vaccinated, and you know, try to gather in well-ventilated areas. So our hospital occupancy is 69%. In Trinidad, it is 75%. In Tobago, it's 38%. We have also noticed a slight plateau in our, in our ICU occupancy. As of this morning, in Trinidad, the ICU occupancy is 79%. And in Tobago, it's 71%. What we have been doing also over the past couple of weeks, working very hard, knowing that Delta is here, and then with Omicron, which seems to be more transmissible, is expanding our step-down capability. We had initially 188 beds over the next, and we have started to increase it. It is going to be increased by an additional 154. So we are going to take our step-down facilities up to 342. From 188, and almost doubling what that means is that we could step down patients more quickly from ward level at our hospitals and make more room there for ward level care, especially if people have to be stepped down from an HCU or an IDU towards. But doing this is just not putting people in a step down facility. What these step down facilities provide is a level of oxygen support. So you can't just have the bed alone. You must have all the support in pharmaceuticals and non-pharmaceuticals, especially in terms of oxygen, because these people will need to have that oxygen therapy for another two, three, four, five days until they are fit and well enough to go home. Bearing that in mind, we have 
distributed over the past couple of weeks 115 oxygen concentrators amongst the five RHAs to meet this demand while we still maintain our piped oxygen um, capacity for high flow and high need patients. So 115 oxygen concentrators from our strategic stock has been deployed. Uh, Eastern RHA got 20. North Central got an additional 15, but they already had a lot of capacity. Northwest got an additional 15. Southwest got 35. And Tobago got 30. So from our strategic stock of oxygen concentrators, we have deployed 115 oxygen concentrators across the five RHAs to meet the increasing need for that type of oxygen therapy at our now expanded step down facilities so that patients can transition from a ward care level, make room there for people who need ward level care, and they step down into these expanded facilities so that we could have the appropriate level of care for the patient with the appropriate clinical signs and symptoms. Um, so we have been noticing a plateauing in the ICU occupancy. We have been noticing a slight decline in our overall occupancy. Um, that is good, but we could do a lot better because, as Dr. Hines will tell you, the majority of persons coming in for treatment continue to be the unvaccinated and let us make a decision to simply get vaccinated. Thank you very much, Al. Thank you very much, Minister. We now move into the question and answer segment. Our media representatives are asked to state their name and the name of the media house that they represent before posing their questions. And of course, because our time is limited, we are requesting a maximum of two questions per media house in the first instance. And if possible, we will field additional questions from representatives once time permits. Our first question this morning goes to Power 102 FM. Good morning. Good morning, this is Marco McIntosh, Power 102 Digital. Um, both of my questions are for Minister Dial Singh. Minister, information reaching our newsroom states that there is a shortage of COVID testing kits in the state sector. Can you comment on this? And secondly, is the Ministry of Health embracing for a surge in COVID-19 cases following Tobago election campaigning? Thank you. Thank you very much. So I could confirm to you there's absolutely no shortage of COVID testing kits in Trinidad and Tobago. That is something we manage closely. As my latest report this morning is that we have 20, 25, 26, um, close to about 40,000 testing kits in the country. Um, we have another 57,600 of the Abbott kits coming in on December the 10th. We have another 100,000 coming in from BGI. Um, so there's absolutely no shortage of testing kits in Trinidad and Tobago. Um, so that report that you have reached is not accurate. We are, and to your second question, we are always prepared to accommodate extra persons following any congregation. Um, let's hope that everything goes well today in Tobago. And you just heard me say that we have expanded our step-down facilities and will be expanding it from 188 beds to 342. That is in preparation for all eventualities, whether it's due to an election, whether it's due to Delta, whether it's due to Omicron, whether it's due to any gathering. But we encourage people, again, to practice the three Ws, plus a V, ventilation, plus a V, vaccine. Thank you very much, Sparkle. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, we now go to Express, Kim Boudram. 
Good morning. Kim, yes, good morning. Kim Woodrum from the Express. Sorry for any technical issues. Uh, Minister, uh, quickly, just to address something uh, in, I know these are private institutions, but to address something that's happening in healthcare and how the Ministry of Health and that is that many institutions now, if you go for treatment, whether it's emergency care, what you must take an antigen test. Of course, there's a cost attached. Um, it ranges from 250, I, I believe, to 400, depending on the institution. But so I can't verify. So how the ministry feels about that that growing cost in healthcare, and also with the Omicron threat, uh, Omicron threat, sorry. Threat. What, uh, what changes you would have you would have spoken to this, but again, what what changes to home health care? Um, perhaps people who are uh, isolated at home with COVID. How how might the ministry want to address that in light of that threat? Thank you. So I will deal with the first question, and Dr. Hines will deal with the second question as to home health care. So we have no control over the prices charged by private institutions. What I could tell you, the practice of doing an antigen test, especially before an emergent surgery, is a good one. In the public sector, let me see if I can get the actual data for you. We have performed over 130,000 antigen tests since we started that. So it's a good practice. It helps the clinicians know um, what they are dealing with, and it's a good practice. We practice it, and as I said, we have done over 130,000 uh, rapid antigen tests. Um, I'll turn you over to Dr. Hines, who will talk about home health care for Omicron. Okay, so thank you for that question. The first point to note, of course, is that at present we do not currently have any cases or confirmed cases or identified cases of the Omicron variant uh, in our population. And we continue to monitor, we continue to sequence, uh, but we haven't detected any of those to date. That's thing one. Secondly, as we do not yet have any information that indicates that there is a need for different clinical management, all of the basic principles of home health care are going to remain largely the same, close monitoring, monitoring of the danger signs, monitoring of your SPO2, et cetera, will continue. Of course, we do advise not only for Omicron, but for any COVID-19 infection, that anybody who starts to feel more unwell than, uh, than before, anybody who starts to feel a decrease in their overall level of well-being should flag that with the, with the individuals following them up and be very, uh, I don't know use the word keen, but be very ready to call for additional help, call for the ambulance to have uh, you reassessed and, if necessary, transferred to uh, an, an escalated level of care. So the home care doesn't change so much just because of the variant. There isn't any indication of additional, what they call virulence, which means the ability to cause severe disease. But we do want to just ensure that everyone who's currently engaged in home care monitors themselves carefully, doesn't wait for, uh, for SPO2 levels to drop drastically, or to be uh, unable to move, to be, you don't want to wait for any of those severe situations or concerns. And as we're on the topic, it's just a, a good reminder, an opportunity to, to remind the population that the SPO2 levels aren't like a, a, a secondary school exam. So 95% is basically your pass or fail mark. Below that, we start to worry. Below 90% is not, well, we're still in the 80s. No, that's, that's time to be concerned. So we definitely don't want to wait until we see SPO2 levels dropping drastically before you decide to seek help. Make sure that you meet, remain in contact with those who are providing what they call that telemedicine uh, oversight. And with those changes in SPO2 levels or feelings of general well-being, make sure to seek care early as opposed to waiting until you're very ill. So that's the the soundbite on home health care for this morning. Thank you very much, Minister. And Dr. Hines, we now go to the Newsday for your two questions. Newsday, good morning. Hi, good morning. Tyrell Gittins from the Trinidad and Tobago Newsday. My two questions are from Minister D. Alsing. Um, the first question being, can you provide some clarity 
on the policy for the third primary dose, more specifically, who is eligible to receive the dose as there is currently some confusion in the public domain. And the second question being, some people are reporting when they go to get their third dose that they are still not to provide all the information that they would have provided before. So can you please give an update on the country's um, digital database and also the electronic vaccine passports? Thank, Thank you. you. So I'll deal with the second one first. So the, um, the electronic database and the QR code system, as I have said um, a couple of times before, that is being uh, rolled out and managed by the Ministry of Digital Transformation, my colleague, Minister Hassel Bacchus. Yes, um, to give some clarity on the additional primary dose. So the additional primary dose that we are currently um, engaged in before we start the booster program, so it's two separate programs. We are currently doing the additional primary dose that is available to persons over 60, regardless of disease state, who have received the Sinopharm vaccine. So if you are over 60, whether you are will, ill, immunocompromised, not ill, fine, over 60, you can get your additional primary dose. For Sinopharm recipients, if you are under 60, you have to provide a letter from your attending physician stating that you are moderately to severely immunocompromised. And I will go through the stage just now. For the other vaccines, like JNJ, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, it is available to anyone regardless of age, but you must be determined by your physician again that you are moderately to severely immunocompromised. Now, what are the immunocompromised states we look at? It's not things like diabetes and hypertension and so on. Those do not necessarily make you immunocompromised. As we have put out in the newspapers, social media on the Ministry of Health website, and we had Dr. LeBlanc, Dr. Hodge speaking on these issues, the following conditions are HIV positive with a CD4 count of 200 and less, patients on hemodialysis, patients with active cancer, patients on immunosuppressive therapy that depresses your immune system. So just to recap, and I'm grateful for the question, for Sinopharm over 60, Anyone over 60 receiving Sinopharm could access the extra dose. For Sinopharm recipients under 60, you must have a letter stating that you are immunocompromised, and I just called out the states. All this information is on the Ministry of Health website. For the other vaccines, regardless of age, once you are moderately to severely immunocompromised, as determined by your physician, you can access your third primary dose if you were vaccinated with a two-dose regime or your second primary dose if you were vaccinated with the Johnson & Johnson one-dose regime. Thank you for the question, and I hope that adds a little more clarity to the issue. Thank you very much, Minister. We go to Guardian Media Limited for your two questions. Good morning. Guardian Media Limited, good morning. Okay, so we seem to have some technical difficulty. We'll move to TV6. Okay. There seems to be some technical, technical difficulty. So I will um, go to Dr. Soju Singh. I know that uh, you would have had uh, your presentation and uh, can you remind us of the risks of COVID-19 to pregnant women and their babies and why they are considered at higher risk? Right, okay, so I would have um, mentioned a little bit of it in the presentation, but just to, to say again, 
that we'd be considering our pregnant women as being uh, physiologically and immunologically, there would be some level of compromise. Um, this is born about worldwide, again, um, especially in the, where the data is coming from, the international setting, uh, where especially in the second half of pregnancy, we are seeing more and more women getting severely ill um, in addition, we've also mentioned this in the past, the Delta variant is adding to this issue with ease of spread and causing more severe disease. Um, the good news is that we haven't seen any syndrome where the COVID virus is actually affecting the baby and causing fetal anomalies. Um, the fetus can be affected um, in terms of having smaller babies, preterm babies. Um, but then I did mention that we have seen mother to child transmission. And we want to re reiterate that vaccines is safe and it is available for second. And third trimester at all our public health uh, secondary care facilities. Thanks. Al. Thank you. I do have a, a follow up question. Um, I recall there are certain pregnant women who are also at higher risk, higher risk than others. Right. Can you reinforce the information on these conditions? Right. Again, yeah. So again, especially, um, and this, this holds um, for added burden to pregnancy. So these would include not just your age, obesity is also a major factor. Um, if you're a force of lower socioeconomic status, we know that's an additional burden on you as well. And mothers, of course, there are mothers who are coming into pregnancy with chronic medical disease. As we get older, you're going to have more levels of high blood pressure and diabetes as well. Thanks. Understood. Um, as well, there has been any, has there been any additional information or update on menstrual disturbances? Um, I know that was a trending topic recently. Yeah, okay, yeah. Thanks, Al, for giving me that chance to talk about this again. And, and um, as you would have realized that this has come off the front pages of the news. It's come worldwide. Um, about a month ago, this was circulating a lot and trending a lot. But the, the simple answer is, and I actually got some additional data, that the studies are continuing. We have yet to s confirm that there is a link between the vaccine and menstrual disturbances. But some studies have come to hand since then, and this is pre-vaccination. What they have found that COVID infection can affect your menstrual cycles. The stress of the pandemic can affect your cycles. As many as one in two to one in three women, even before the vaccines, did have a level of menstrual disturbances. The research continues, and of course, we will update you with reliable information once it comes to hand. Thank you, Al. Thank you very much, Dr. Siju Singh. Uh, we must advise that the Zoom link is temporarily down, so we are unable to facilitate questions from the media, but we will continue with the press conference. Uh, this time we go across to Dr. Hines, who will give us further update on the Omicron variant. Okay, thank you, Mr. Alexander. So it's not so much a further update, but it's really a little more detail going into a little more of the understanding of what we do need to be aware of, conscious of, as we move from one stage to the next in the pandemic. This new variant, the Omicron variant, while we are still collecting information on it, while we are assessing whether or not it does actually present a greater risk of severe illness, a greater risk of transmission, a greater risk of uh, immune evasion and reinfection or not, we do want to continue to advise the population not to become, as the minister would have pointed out, prematurely uh, relaxed about the emergence of a new variant. We don't want to become uh, desensitized. And to treat the emergence of a new variant as though it's nothing to be uh, concerned about. most certainly a cause for concern, though not a cause for alarm or panic. It is a cause for us to remember the basic rules of reduction and transmission and those rules 
in reverse order, uh, starting with the most important, getting the vaccine. That vaccination is going to help to reduce your risk of transmission, and it's also going to help to reduce your risk of becoming severely ill. They already have preliminary data that supports that. The mask wearing, which is going to allow you to reduce your risk even further of spreading droplets via your mouth and nose. And I, I want to emphasize nose because we continue to see individuals wearing the mask only over their mouth as though their nose is not connected to the respiratory system. So having that, uh, that coverage, so to speak, pun intended, will also help w along with the vaccine coverage to reduce risks of transmission, especially uh, as we continue to move about avoiding crowded spaces, avoiding the uh, overcrowding of spaces in the first place, and if a space appears crowded, then not necessarily going in unless it's you know, absolutely essential. All of these things are behaviors that we're going to need to continue to exercise our discretion in as the festive season continues. As the festive season continues and people move around, okay. we are going to need to balance the movement, the economic activity, having a job, getting your, your basic uh, domestic stuff done, you need to balance that against risk reduction. So we do have to play the, the role as members of the public, the role of that final bastion against transmission by following the public health guidelines and by increasing our uptake of the vaccine so that we can reduce risk. I believe that the transmission, the uh, Zoom link is back up. I'm going to yes, turn it back over to Mr. Alexander. All right, but we will take a, a question that I would have received from Guardian Media Limited. Um, the U.S. and U.K. have now adjusted the time frame for negative PCR tests for entry. Is TNT considering any adjustments to out-entry protocol to protect against Omicron? I'm guessing it's our, not out. Thank you. So... We continue to monitor developments internationally and locally. And as soon as we make any decision to vary the current travel advisories, as usual, we will come to you, the public, and let you know via the media. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. Also, the reports that people have been presenting two vaccine cards at safe zones with different brands of vaccines. Reports are that people are lying and saying they haven't gotten a vaccine prior in order to get boosters or vaccines of their choosing. What is the ministry doing to address the and is there any legal repercussions? Okay, so whether there are any legal repercussions, um, we have been looking at that because those same reports did come to us. Thank you for raising the issue. And um, currently, the, the legal department is in fact looking at it. What will happen is that the database that we are building now will eventually bring all of that to light and if there are any legal ramifications for those persons, um, we will deal with that. We will deal with that then. But um, whenever we ask for the hard information, we never get it. So if anybody has the hard information, the name of a person, uh, a phone number, please let us know. Let us work together. Because whenever we ask, give us the information, give us a name, give us a number, that is where things start to crumble and fall down so let's work together on that thank you thank you minister and yes the the link is back up so we can welcome back our media representatives so we go to tv6 tv6 we are ready Last week, Dr. Joan Pollen, in speaking about the Omicron variant, she noted it was very transmissible, but the symptoms were much milder. 
and she was talking about the natural evolution of the, you know, the virus and the pandemic. And she said that Delta was the strongest virus that we had today, which is dominant here. And she said, and these were her words, she said, uh, the Omicron, and this is what she said, it could be the turn point. So I'm wondering, um, how does the Ministry of Health feel about Omicron? Do you all think that it could actually work in the favor of the population, so to speak? If it becomes an strain, it all beats Delta, but symptoms are much. That's the first question. The second question is, uh, could you have some more information about this mother to child transmission of COVID, please? Is it that, I'm, I'm assuming this would have happened in the womb during the pregnancy, is it that as soon as the child is born, they are being born, um, they're being tested for COVID? How was it determined at this time that it was mother to child and not that the child was born and then got it from the mother who was positive? Or, information thank you thank you Renessa. two really good questions and i really want to thank you for bringing in dr stewart just on that that's a very important topic thank you so i will deal with the first question yes the current uh so dr joan paul was um was spot on if you look at the current data current current as we stand omicron is making its way across the world and in many countries, the trend is that Omicron, because of higher transmissibility, may become the dominant uh, strain. Um, Trinidad and Tobago, so far, with these variants of concern, we have followed, unfortunately, the international norms. Um, so it is, yeah, Omicron, because of transmissibility, may become the dominant variant in Trinidad and Tobago. I will now turn you over to Dr. Hines to give his expert opinion on that before we go to Dr. Sirju Singh. Thank you, Minister. So as we've been seeing, the evolution of the information on each of these variants is something that we actually have the opportunity to witness sort of day by day. It's something that is new we didn't have that for example with the uh, pandemic influenza etc it wasn't the same level of uh, visible evolution we couldn't we weren't following the changes to the same extent that we're seeing for this particular virus so as the minister pointed out at present the information that is being seen and a lot of it is coming from south africa where they've actually identified that there's community transmission that shows that it's out competing the variant that was in south africa which is that beta variant we're still going to have to wait to see whether it does the same with other variants but the possibility exists and because the possibility exists we do need to continue to be aware that once a new variant gets introduced there is the possibility of another surge so that's what we've been seeing globally, new variant introduced surge in cases, and sometimes the surge doesn't ever completely return to normal. You may have some decrease, a plateau, and then another variant and an increase, and that's what we've been seeing globally. So we continue to be concerned that this is a possibility, and although, as uh, you pointed out, I believe there was some electronic disturbance, so we couldn't hear you very clearly, although I think what you're saying is that what was said was, Oh, you're seeing a milder range of disease. It's still very early days with regard to designating it as less virulent or more virulent. So we're going to need to keep our guard up. Right. Okay. Um, again, thank you for that um, excellent question. Again. Um, so this one is uh, more scientific at this point in time, but very early in the pandemic, um, some cases in China where they had mother-to-child transmission. Now, these are still remain very um, a low incidence of these cases happening. The exact mechanisms aren't quite clear yet. Um, the ones that we have had in Trinidad and Tobago, we, we have a very rigorous um, 
process where our patients are being screened when they're coming in for delivery, if you're having a caesarean section, during antenatal visits, and therefore we are detecting COVID in our pregnant patients. And if you are in the labor ward and you deliver, these babies are swabbed at birth as part of our protocol. So these four cases that I did mention are in four babies, newborn babies at delivery, where we actually picked up and we believe these are mother to child transmissions. Two of those babies so far are, are well, asymptomatic. Um, in one case, we did have a stillbirth, which is a recognized complication of COVID-19. And we are still investigating one other case for the details. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Sujit Singh. We go to the Express for a follow-up question. Oh, sorry, EZP News. EZP News. Good morning, Swan Wayo from EZP News. I have two questions, one for Dr. Sergio Singh and one for the Minister. Uh, Minister, do we have any updates regarding the third primary dose for other vaccinated individuals that the Ministry is working towards? And to Dr. Sergio Singh, I'm pregnant and I'm concerned that since the expiry date of the Pfizer vaccine has been extended, it may not be as effective. Should this be a turn to them? And will Gerard and Tobago be bring more Pfizer vaccine for this particular group as well as for maybe perhaps the AZ Pfizer mixed with the third group? Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so could you expand on your question? I really didn't get the gist of the meaning about the third primary dose. Could you just re-ask, please? Thank you. So, uh, yeah. with respect to this third primary dose, there was mention of it on that you all were working towards having that for normal vaccinated persons, persons without comorbidities. Um, can you expand on that in terms of any further regarding a particular issue? Yeah. Okay, thank sorry. you. I understand now. Thank you. So there's a distinction to be made between what we are doing now, which is the additional primary dose, whether it's a third dose if you got a two-dose regime, or whether it's a second dose if you got a one-dose vaccine. So it's not a third primary dose. It's an additional primary dose which can either be a third dose or a second dose, depending on which vaccine you got. That is what we are doing now. As I explained last week, Monday, we hope to transition from that region now that we have built up a strategic stock of vaccines and all that, to Booster dose, regardless of disease state and or age. So it's two separate programs. What is being run now is the additional primary dose, which could be a third dose if you got a two-dose regime, or a second additional dose if you knew, if you were the recipient of the one-dose GNG. So I hope that answers your question. Dr. Sirju Singh will go into the technical details of your second question. What he can't answer is the acquisition of vaccine, which is my domain. And as I explained on Saturday, we are in bilateral talks with vaccine manufacturers. We are in talks with COVAX. And we are in talks um, through diplomatic channels, as we have always been, those three channels, to get more vaccines into the country. Uh, no hand you over to Dr. Sujit Singh. Thanks, Honourable Minister. So yes, I think um, I think that answers most of the questions. Um, we want to reassure pregnant population, that's the specific target group, that we actually have enough Pfizer vaccine stockpile for you. And here's where uh, where I'd like to emphasize that persons should not be skipping the queue 
and rejoining the queue to get a second set of Pfizer vaccines, which they were not eligible for, because of course these may be earmarked for some other personnel. So by that healthy person who has had, let's say, uh, two AZ or two Sinopharm and Johnson and & Johnson, and they're now getting a new card, which is one of the issues we talked about, they would be now rejoining the queue and taking away from those vaccines earmarked for pregnant women. And Honorable Minister can add to the, if any, additional information. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Suji Singh and Minister. We go to addition, an additional question from the Express. Guardian Media Limited. Good morning. Okay, Express, go ahead. Good. Okay, I'm sorry. Good morning. Thank you. I just asked if the minister could provide a cost antigen test that the public sector would have registered so far. And if possible, break down the cost for the test. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So the antigen tests uh, that we get in the public sector, which we provide free of charge, Source through PAHO, and we bring in two types. Um, I think the last time I checked on the price, they were under about $10 US for one. So that's what we would pay, but we provide it free of charge to the public. And as I said, we have done over 130,000 of those free antigen tests so far in the public sector. Thank you, Minister. Guardian Media, your follow-up question, please. Hi, morning, everyone. Rashad Khan, Guardian Media. Uh, my question is, Dr. Sir Singh, I'm sorry, I did before and I just didn't hear because we are having some technical difficulties on our end. I have made mention of the seven uh, maternal deaths and then the four cases of mother to child transmission. But what I'm wondering, um, have we seen any other complications that have come out of a pregnant um, contracting COVID-19? Uh, I know you mentioned still births there at, at one point. Yes, please. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry about that, Richard. Um, yes, so in terms of complications, so we've actually had four uh, patients with maternal deaths who were COVID positive. So the number is four. We've had a total of seven maternal deaths in Trinidad and Tobago for this year. Um, in terms of the complications, see. They're very similar to what we saw, uh, what we are seeing worldwide and reported, a higher incidence of high blood pressure in pregnancy. Preterm labor is very common, so these patients may deliver their babies before time. The babies are not growing as well, which is called small for gestational age, um, stillbirths, as I said before. These are the common complications, and of course, when mother is ill, you need to aspire part of our protocol, you may need to deliver this baby in order to save a woman's life. And this is what's called iatrogenic or induced prematurity. So those are some of the complications. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Suji Singh and Minister. We have come to the end of today's media conference. Remember that we all have an important role to play in protecting Trinidad and Tobago from COVID-19. Keep making the responsible decision to follow the health guidelines. Let's get back to basics, including wearing your mask, washing your hands, social distancing, and of course, let's vaccinate TNT. Goodbye for now. TTT News, nightly at 6.30.
TDT News, committed, accurate, relevant. I solemnly pledge to dedicate my life